know it. So we, uh, theonomy is about God's law, the law of God, and so the psalm that you must study is 119. O Lord, you are the righteous one. Just judgments come from you. Your testimonies you command in righteousness and truth. My zeal consumes me utterly. Your words my foes have shunned because your words are very pure. Your servant loves each one. Though I am lowly and despised, your laws I'll not forget. Eternal is your righteousness. In your law truth is set. Though grief and trouble come to me, your law is my delight. Your laws forever righteous are. Through wisdom give me life. A little bit challenging there, but well done, and we'll continue to learn that as the weeks go on. Have a seat. Our third month of the Institute this year, and this year's structure is a little bit different from last year. We're going to be tackling different subjects every month, um, so a lot of these are really kind of overview, flyovers of these different topics in a lot of ways. There's a lot more to go into, um, so we pray that this kind of propels you to study these further uh, and dig into them. Um, so this month's topic is theonomy. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, there's a lot of controversy around this very subject. Uh, I think uh, misunderstandings, miscommunications, that type of stuff that goes into it. Um, so before we get into it, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you and thank you for your word as your word describes who you are and describes what life is about and what humanity is called to do before you, a holy and righteous God. We ask that you minister to our hearts, our minds, our wills uh, in a very important subject um, for our day, especially as we see a lot of things happening in our world that uh, don't seem right. And so help us to be uh, charitable, help us to be um, balanced, help us to be steadfast in the search of your word and understanding it as we grow in our Christian faith. And so, um, please be merciful to us today as we get into a, 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 again, a hard subject, um, one that uh, I seem very unfit to, to deal with, but uh, I pray that I do it faithfully um, as you have convicted me on this very thing, and so help me to communicate well uh, and to uh, be faithful to your word, uh, ultimately uh, for the glory of Christ and his kingdom. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Okay, so just as we've done with some of these other classes, I'm going to go through um, some recommendations in reading. 
Uh, this is the first one by this standard, The Authority of God's Law Today by Greg Bonson. This is good. A little more concise, shorter read. Uh, very good, very helpful. Uh, a couple of thicker reads, Joseph Boot, um, and this is The Mission of God. Uh, this is an amazing book, uh, very, very good, very, very important, and he's actually going to be the main speaker at the Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society's conference this year, Future of Christendom. So a plug for that, middle of October, amazing guy, and I actually um, got confirmation that he will be preaching here that Sunday as well. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so this is a really amazing book, and I would highly encourage you to be at that conference too. So there's information coming out about that um, as we speak. Also, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, uh, Thicker Read by Greg Bonson. Uh, Dennis mentioned this in an ethics class. This is also very good. And then you want to go even thicker. You can get a three-volume set, uh, Institutes of Biblical Law by Rush Dooney. Um, there's a lot that he covers in a lot of specifics. I have not gone through all of it, um, but it's a heavy read, and so you are more than welcome to buy a three-volume set and dive in, and this is the first volume, so you can get through this, and I think you're on your way. <laughs> but so with that, um, there's a lot, of other, a lot of other good resources that, um, that are founded upon theonomy, on, on God's law, on the validity and applicability of it today um, that I'll mention as we go through the class. But that's really the bulk of um, foundational ones that really um, address the very topic itself. Um, so I would encourage you to, if, if this drives you to more study and more reading, I'd encourage you to, to read those. Uh, what I want to do today um, is get into trying to define theonomy um, and then go through some helpful thoughts and, and common objections, um, and then we'll, we'll look at one passage uh, as kind of a foundational getting into this, this topic itself. Um, but essentially, Theonomy is theos and namos, God and law, so God's law. Uh, that is opposed to self-law, autonomy. Um, and so there bears the question for one and all of life as a Christian, which one do we want? Uh, we know that m neutrality is a myth. Uh, there is no neutrality. Uh, and so we're going to be operating uh, towards one or the other. And so uh, that needs to be a question that kind of abides in just our Christian life, and one that we'll get into as, as you keep that in your mind and, and some of these points that I'll, I'll make in a little bit. Um, but theonomy, as I try to define it, uh, it's, it's essentially a Christian's recognition that the law of God is still valid in all of life, and it is then the Christian's duty and action to faithfully apply how it is valid in all of life, as God's law is taken and applied specifically to today. And this must be done in light of what Jesus has done, especially as the great high priest who was once for all sacrificed for sin. And so, how to apply God's law to today? And what does that look like in all spheres of life, in all governments of life? Self-government, home government, church government, civil government. Um, and so, I would say that that would be the framework in which we look at the scriptures and look at through that, through that frame to the world and how we understand how God's law applies in all of these areas. Now today, primarily the discussion about, uh, regarding theonomy is in the civil area of life. That's where a lot of the discussion a lot, and a lot of the heat, a lot of the controversy really uh, exists is in the civil area of life. So as civil governments, as high positions uh, of authority, how does God's law apply to them? What are they obligated to do? Uh, what does that look like in the very functions of government? Um, and so in that area of life, especially with things that have influenced our, our culture and our thinking, especially within the church, I think there's trouble that a lot of people have in that area. Um, that's where a lot of pushback comes from, a lot of objections come from um, that reject theonomy 
And I think a lot of times, I think it's, in, in big ways, it's misunderstood. Um, and so I want to kind of lay a, found, a, a, a foundation, a framework in which we can get to looking at the civil area of life, but first look at self-government, home government, church government, um, and keeping those in mind. I think all Christians, true Christians, are theonomists. I think they operate theonomically, whether they understand it or recognize it or not. And I'll give some, uh, and I've mentioned this if you, you know, come here, um, but I've mentioned this before. Uh, there's a couple of areas in which I think this, this is bared out. The first one is, if you're a Christian and you, you think highly of keeping the Sabbath, for example, then if you're not adhering to a one-to-one ratio, a one-to-one comparison to the Mosaic law, how keeping the Sabbath was in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, if you're not keeping to that, but you think highly of keeping the Sabbath, going to church faithfully, honoring the Lord's Day, you are operating as a theonomist. You are looking at the Old Covenant, the Old, the Mosaic Law, in regards to the keeping of the Sabbath, and you're saying, okay, that was then, how does this now apply to today? And even looking further, this was bared out in the creation. And so even seeing the validity from the beginning, going all the way through the Mosaic Law, to then, what does it look like today? And so I, I preached on this a while ago, so I'm not going to get into the details, um, but if you do that as, as a, a, a contemporary Christian in our society, you are acting theonomically. You are working from a theonomic framework without even realizing, taking God's law and, and seeing, okay, how does this apply to today? How I am to be faithful to that in my day and age, especially post-cross, right? Especially when this must be done in light of what Jesus has done, especially as the great high priest who was once for all the sacrifice for sin. So this takes on a whole new light today. We need to look at it in a framework in which how do we apply that faithfully and not a one-to-one exact comparison today. So that's one example. The other example is tithing, right? Tithing. It's not the exact same framework specifics in tithing of the Old Covenant of the Old Testament, right? We have, we have looked to apply it to today of how does it look in the new covenant? How does it look post-cross, after Christ? What does that look like for us? And so if you are doing that, if you are not adhering exactly to every detail in the old covenant, in the Old Testament, then you are acting theonomically. You are working from a theonomic framework to then understand how it applies to now. I think there's a lot of principles in which we need to see from the Old Testament, but it's not a one-to-one exact comparison. There's, there's issues that, that need to take place. Also, if you're a parent and you have raised kids at a young age from beginning to all the way through at various stages, and you operate from God's law and, and demanding commanding your kids to not lie, not steal, uh, honor you as parents, then you are operating from a theonomic framework. And that is going to be um, more drawn out in, in, in when we look at the uses of the law in, in a week or two. But you're already operating from a theonomic perspective. How do I, as a Christian, operate my home and expect unbelievers at a very young age to obey God's law. You expect them to do that. And so that's already looking at it from a a, a theonomic framework. And so these are ways in which we can really see, apart from the civil controversy, uh, that Christians really operate as theonomists without really even thinking about it without even really realizing it. And so hopefully that kind of softens people a little bit to this subject, makes them think a little bit more of then what does this mean even further, especially as we get to the civil area of life. But what it calls for then is distinctions between the moral law, 
uh, ceremonial law and the civil judicial law. How do those apply to today? And that's, that's, that's a lot of work to, to sift through and figure out. And that'll be a part of things that we'll mention um, er, later on in the class. But those are important because, again, it's all, this is, applying God's law to today is all in light of what Jesus has done. Right, as the great high priest of what he's done and sacrificing himself. And so how then, like for, for instance, ceremonial law? How does ceremony, how does the ceremonial law apply to today? Are there still parts of the ceremonial law that are binding? If so, what? Or what principles ought we take from there to today? How do we distinguish between those? That's an important distinction of the three different distinctions of the law, moral, ceremonial, and civil and judicial. How do those then apply to today? And so that's, those are things to think about as we uh, kind of deal with this whole topic of, of theonomy. Now, in kind of defining it, laying out some, some various things uh, that I just mentioned, I want to go through some helpful thoughts and some common objections that um, I've had to deal with and, and, and other things um, that, that are quite helpful to kind of think through. One, one major objection to theonomy is that uh, many people say, well, but we're not Israel today. Right? The church is not Israel. The church is not, has not been given the law directly from God in the same context of Israel. So therefore, since we are not Israel, it's not binding on us. Or we, we, we wash out the validity or applicability of God's law because we're not Israel. And so there's, there's no ultimate point or, um, or need to apply God's law in detailed areas, especially when you get into the civil area of life. And so I, I, I think that misses the big point. For one, uh, because God, as, as Christians, we... On from our end, we come into covenant with God. We, as a people, whether in the church, whether at home, whether at self, even whether in the civil area, we come into covenant with God from our perspective and say, Lord, you've regenerated me. For the purpose of that, I, I will live lawfully. I will live to keep your commandments, to obey you, in the obedience of faith. And so I want to operate from that. And so I'm saying I, I, I'm, I'm, saying I am going to do that. And therefore, I'm coming in covenant with you, and that's, whole, that's completely different from being a Israel context, that we as Christians look at the purpose of salvation, Titus 2, 11 through 14, the purpose of salvation is that he's redeemed us from all lawlessness to make a people who are zealous for good works. What are good works? Obeying God's law. Not just in self, not just in my own little bubble but outwardly in all areas of life. And so though, yes, we aren't Israel exactly, there are so many points in which this still applies. And to say that we're not Israel and then to kind of slough off God's law and its, its validity is, is really missing the whole point. Uh, another common objection is that uh, when we look at civil law and saying that our civil laws should reflect God's law in, in a general way, and we'll even get to a conviction that I've had and been growing in last class uh, of the month coming up. Um, but the objection is, is that we, we can't expect unbelievers to obey, to adhere to God's law. We can't expect them to do that. So therefore, since we can't expect them to do that, we really shouldn't strive to have our law in uh, reflective of God's law, based upon God's law, because they can't obey it anyway. Now, here's two distinctions that really need to uh, be driven into that point, and to kind of mix them, to confound this, it, it, it shows that we haven't grown and learned uh, more just basic elements of, of Christianity, and thinking, one, yeah, we are sinful in nature, right? So in terms of salvation, unbelievers can't obey God's law. They have no ability to once they, uh, you know, before, before salvation, before Christ. 
So they have no ability to obey God's law. But once they are saved, once they come to be saved, what do they now have? They now have an ability to obey God's law. So in, a, in our sin nature, in the context of salvation, yeah, they can't obey God's law. But does that automatically apply to what we're talking about? No. And that goes then into the uses of God's law, which we'll deal with more in detail in classes to come. But here is, here's the point, and, and, and I would make the correlation again to your home. You're a parent with young kids who are unbelievers. You expect them to obey God's law, even when they're an unbeliever. You expect them to adhere to God's law, even when you're an unbeliever. So this goes into the uses of God's law. Two uses of God's law before salvation is to restrain sin, restrain wickedness. So in your home, you're doing that, right? You're telling them, these are things that you need to obey. And if you don't obey, you're going to get punished. And then is to be a mirror of sin, a mirror to see our sin for what it is. So if you are a Christian parent, then hopefully you're wanting your kids to see their sin, for what it truly is before God, so that the gospel can come rushing into that void and bring them the good news about Christ and life in Christ. And so, on one sense, yeah, we can't expect unbelievers to obey God's law, our sin nature. But at the same time, the uses of God's law are to confront human nature with that very law, to restrain their sin and wickedness in a societal sense. And to be a mirror to show them their sin for what it truly is. So to, to, to object to theonomy and say that we can't expect unbelievers to obey God's law, therefore we really shouldn't be doing, you know, applying God's law and all of that, is just, it, it misses the point. It misunderstands completely major, major aspects of, of what this is all about. Another one uh, that is a common objection, and this kind of goes with theonomists, post-mill people, is that uh, they're really a bunch of ide- uh, ideolo- idealists. They're just looking way to the future and how things should be. And they're always harping on that. They're always focused on that. But they're really not dealing with the now. They're not good. They're not useful with the now. I think in a lot of ways from the outside perspective of that objection looking into theonomists, I think in large aspects it's not true. For one, because I think there's a misunderstanding of what theonomy actually is, and then seeing it working within somebody's life. So I think in a lot of ways that that's a misunderstanding, but also I think it's a good warning. It's a good warning for all Christians, let alone theonomists, because we should not always be looking ahead and just be so fixed on what it should be, even though that's crucially important. But we need to then see how we can get to that point, what we need to be doing up until that point to where we hopefully achieve what is honoring to God, what, what, what point we should get to. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, common objections that I think don't hold weight at all in in the whole topic of of theonomy. And even further is uh, an intention of theonomy, an intention even on on post-millennialism as well, is that people think it's it's trying to achieve perfection, the side of heaven. Trying to get to a point where we come and we have made it. We've achieved what we're supposed to be doing. We're, we're achieving some kind of perfection or getting to that point. And I think, again, that, that's, that's misunderstanding the very fact that we live in a sinful world that should be utterly obvious to every Christian. And so we shouldn't have that misunderstanding that we're just trying to be perfect and trying to achieve perfection. We're not, in a lot of ways, because we're still dealing with sinners And it's not going to be completely eradicated this side of heaven. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for what really honors God in these facets of life. Especially when it gets to the civil area of life. Because we understand and know how important it is. God has given two ministries. Ministry of the word in the church and ministry of the sword in civil government. Really important facets of 
the ministry of God. Servants, right? God calls uh, governing authorities deacons, servants of him. And so that's really important. And, and to understand the intention of the theonomic framework and not misunderstand that we're trying to achieve some type of perfection here and now. A furthermore, helpful thought to think about is the topic of antinomianism. Antinomianism essentially is anti-law. Now, historically, there's been a heresy with it in regards to salvation. Um, antinomianism in that category is that you basically have Jesus as Savior. You can deal with his lordship later. You can kind of live however you want, theoretically, though, you know, it's not... Uh, we want you to try to be good uh, in obeying God's law, but it's not necessary in how, what God does in salvation. Uh, and so anti-laws, we're done with the law, right? Jesus has fulfilled it. Therefore, it's not binding in any way. And some Christians go to that extreme, go to that point, go to an antinomian mentality when it comes to salvation. Uh, now, when it gets to this category, this conversation, there's some, some extremes that we can go to. So anything that moves in the other direction of God's law and is moving toward antinomianism is either towards no law, anti-law, or toward man-made law. So God's law is here, and antinomian nature, antinomian mentality either says we don't need that. That's not valid. And so we're moving away and saying no to God's law, anti-law, anti-God's law. Or we're moving in a direction so much that we have been in a routine of, of creating our own law and doing it perpetually, doing it in an ongoing manner where the mass majority of what we have is man-made law that really is not honoring to God's law. And so that's moving in another direction of antinomian mentality, moving away from what God has given in his law, in his case law, and moving from there and developing our own laws that really are not adhering or honoring God's law in, in respects. And so those are some things to think about, some things to sift through. Um, the other one I'll mention is helpful, which is, one of the aspects that was very helpful to me in coming to a conviction that the theonomic understanding is biblical and very biblical uh, is the use of God's law evangelistically. And this, again, kind of goes into the uses of God's law that if I'm wanting to be evangelistic, faithful to the Scriptures, then I can look to Christ and see how he called many people to obey the law. The Good Samaritan, the beginning at the end of that section, says, he says, go and do that. Go and do the law. Go obey the law. Why did he even say that? What was the point of it? It was to empty those self-righteous people out from themselves, to empty them, to show them that it was utterly impossible for them to obey God's law. And and how to show them that is the two uses of God's law before salvation. And so if I'm thinking evangelistically, then I'm going to want my civil laws to be God's law. So that wickedness is restrained in a societal way, in a communal way. And then even further, if, I have, if we have good intention evangelistic Christians in those areas of life, then the mirror of sin is going to come and be confronting them, showing them their sin for what it truly is, and again, emptying them out. So that then that Christian in that situation can bring the gospel to them. Whether they're a judge, whether they're a president of something, whether they're a governor, whether they're a school teacher, whatever it may be in whatever, whatever civil society area you're living in and operating in, you are working evangelistically from that standpoint that God's law has a major use in that whole endeavor. It's not just quote-unquote gospel. They need the gospel. They need the message about Christ. But ultimately, how do you even get to that point? 
What do you even do with sinners who by our nature are self-righteous, puffed up, conceited, not understanding who we are, and needing to see ourselves in a mirror? And so uh, there's, again, a lot of things to kind of think about. Those are very general things. Um, One kind of quote that just kind of wraps a lot of this up, essentially, I think, is is a quote from Rush Dooney. This is the introduction for his uh, volume one. He says this, quote, Lawless Christianity is a contradiction in terms. It is anti-Christian. The purpose of grace is to not set aside the law, but to fulfill the law and to enable man to keep the law. If the law was so serious in the sight of God that it would require the death of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, to make atonement for man's sin, it seems strange for God then to proceed to abandon the law. The goal of the law is not lawlessness, nor the purpose of grace, a lawless contempt of the giver of grace. And this really goes to the further purpose of salvation that I mentioned in in Titus 2, 11 through 14, is that he redeemed us from the law so that he could establish people who are zealous for good works in obedience to him. Now, does this mean that it's just yourself, life, just by yourself, or maybe at home, maybe trickling into the church in some minimalistic way? Or is it incredibly valid for civil government? And that's really where the discussion really is fought over today. And it's something that is really necessary that we wrestle with this and we listen to one another. We go to those who actually hold these positions and listen to what they say, examine it in light of the scriptures, and move on from there. But this is a massively important topic. And so those are some, hopefully, some helpful thoughts, some common objections to kind of deal with, and and we'll touch on more of them as we go. Um, But with the remainder of the time, I wanted to look at Matthew 15, or Matthew 5, 17 through 20. So if you have your Bible, open it up. There's a pew Bible in front of you. And this is often one that is um, used to go against theonomy. But I'm not sure how. (laughs) I think it's more clear in the text itself and the context of this passage that speaks to basically the definition of theonomy that I gave you. And I'll just repeat that again to bring us into this text. A Christian's recognition that the law of God is still valid in all of life. And it is then the Christian's duty and action to faithfully apply how it is valid in all of life, as God's law is taken and applied specifically today, which must be done in light of what Jesus did, especially as the great high priest who was once for all the sacrifice for sin. So let's read the, let's read the passage. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For because truly I tell you, uh, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or, a dot, or not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these, or relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same would be called least in the kingdom of God. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of God. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So I think, for one, yes, it's talking about Jesus and the fulfillment of God's law as the substitute for sinners. As the righteous one who came to fulfill the law for us. Because the law condemns us. And so in order to stand before God, righteous, we need his obedience to become our obedience. But it goes further in applying the trajectory of righteousness. And I would again cite Titus 2, 11 through 14 again. The purpose of God's law, or the purpose of salvation, is to 
create, recreate human beings who are obedient to God's law, zealous for good works, because it drives to uh, the law not being just a self-salvation, but one that permeates all of life, one that continues on for all of life. And this, I think, is very clear in the fact that you're, you're not relaxing one of the least of these commandments. The commandments, God's law. You're not teaching others to do the same. You're doing the opposite. You're doing them, and you're teaching others to do them. So a question here, for one, is, is this kingdom of heaven talking about just the eternal state? But I would ask you, if you think that, then teaching others to do God's law, to obey God's law, teaching others to do that, does that exist in heaven? Why would we teach others when sin is eradicated? When there's no lawlessness in the kingdom of heaven. So there won't be any teaching to do God's law. We're going to do it. We're going to love him. We're going to be sinless. We're going to be lawful and just by nature then. As we are completely glorified. And so this context is not just future in the eternal state. It's talking about now. It's talking about within the Christian life. And so it it drives at the validity, the applicability of God's law. God's law being a part of the Christian life. Not just to understand the imputed righteousness of Christ, that we are righteousness, uh, that we are righteous in Him, but then the purpose of that law is to then live out our own righteousness, to grow in holiness, to grow in the obedience of faith. And so as we then think about how God uh, works in all of creation in terms of God's law, it's either judgment or mercy. Judgment because sinners are left condemned under God's law. They have to obey it. But without Christ, they're left with nothing. They're going to be judged. And so that will be for judgment. But if it's for mercy, then it's based upon whose righteousness? The righteousness of Christ. So it's based on his righteousness, his lawfulness in Christ. And so as judgment and mercy are coming from God, it runs through the law. It runs through our relation to the law in light of Christ and our, the demand that the law has on us. Every single person will be held accountable to God and what they've done. So they're going to stand before God and be in eternal condemnation for what they've done, or they're going to stand before God wrapped in the righteousness of Christ and seeing that His work has become our work, and so we will then enter into eternal life, into eternal glory in that aspect. But we cannot miss the very fact that this passage is teaching the validity of God's law in the context of the Christian life, in teaching to do, and in doing this. Again, there won't be any teaching about obedience to God in heaven because there won't be any sin. There won't be any lawlessness in in that eternal state. So further, this isn't just, and, and, and we, with our pietism today, and even the influences of the cheap grace movement, the the non-lordship stuff, the easy believism, the antinomianism in regards to salvation, we have so sectioned off ourselves to where we look at the Christian life in just this kind of spiritual sense that we're just living a spiritual life that really doesn't affect our lives and what we do, especially further out in society. But it's more about self. It's more about our personal little relationship with Jesus Christ by ourselves. And that's really it. But how can we really look at the passage like this and think that? Does this apply to the one who 1 Timothy 2 talks about when they come to salvation? They're a person in high position, high authority. When they come to salvation... 
then they do their job differently. And the Christians that live under their rule will then live peaceful, quiet, godly lives, dignified in every way. So it's not just self, it's not just personal holiness, and it's not just even in the realm of my, my home. Those are fundamental, but it's going to affect elsewhere. It's going to affect how civil law is brought out, even understanding what civil law is, what context it should be under. Do we even create our own law, or is it just God's law? And that's the reference alone. Those are questions that need to be asked. And so there's a lot, a whole lot to think about uh, in this topic. Um, I just wanted to really just bring out some brief, um, laying the groundwork, I guess, of defining, of thinking through some helpful thoughts, some common objections. Looking at a passage that is often used to, uh, to try and dismantle theonomy and the theonomic uh, the, the mindset, the the, the perspective, but I think it's really teaching the opposite. It's really teaching the validity of God's law in, in, in what we're called to do in all areas of life. Um, and so with that, um, let's pray, and if there's any questions, we'll, we'll dive into those. Let's pray. Actually, we'll save prayer for after that before we eat. Any questions? And this is a tough subject. This is, again, kind of just basic groundwork first to then hopefully get into some other things in the weeks to come. Questions? Yeah. Well, it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, one objection that you said that I hear all the time is um, you guys just want the church to take over. The yeah, an ecclesiocracy. ecclesiocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is completely a, a massive misunderstanding of what theonomists would hold to. Uh, there's a difference between church and state. There's a difference in jurisdictions. Um, and so we're not wanting to develop the church-run state, and even with that is the, uh, mis- the misunderstanding of that we're going to impose in a, in a tyrannical uh, way, in an authoritarian way, to demand or, or make people be Christians. We can't make people be Christians in that way. Uh, and so I think that's a complete misunderstanding. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of problems with that. Yeah, for sure. And any other thoughts or comments or questions? What would be the Yeah, I, I would go to, Bonson deals with that quite in, in a lot of detail. Um, I would basically, I think a lot of the situations, and I think there's varying opinions. Uh, and Joel, maybe you may be able to speak to this a little bit better. Um, but I think they're, they take that as just looking at Jesus' uh, work uh, in the law in regards to salvation itself. And really, that's it. Um, so that's the context that they put it in, that he's fulfilled the law uh, for, for sinners. Uh, he was born under the law to fulfill the law, so therefore now that he's fulfilled it, that's really uh, invalid in that sense, which I don't know how they get there because the rest of the passage just seems like it's refuting that. Do you have any, do you have any more um, experience with that? Yeah. So rightly it just makes sense to us. Right. So I'm here to fulfill it. Therefore, do not keep it as the great thing to make. Yeah. That's very difficult to be fulfilled. Yeah. I, I don't I, I've spent a long time trying to figure that out and I can't. Because it doesn't make sense because there is those two aspects that yes, Jesus has fulfilled it in salvation terms, but then because he has, then we are to obey it. Then it gives it even more validity. It seems that way to me. If, if all he said was, boy, I just want to enjoy what, 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 then we just went on. 
Yeah. I could get it. Yeah. But for him to say who's going to there for based on what I just said. Right. So break these commandments and set them aside. Yeah. I just don't see how you do it. Yeah. I've tried to learn. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I would, uh, Bonson, in both of those books with Bonson, he, he does, deals with that quite a bit. Yeah, and it, again, I think it's similar to like the Arminian, where they take texts out of context and really just completely distort something that is very clear. You just don't get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So where those things parse out, so I'm Yeah. Because I mean, if all the ceremonial law pointed towards Jesus and was fulfilled by Jesus, how we are not under Jews who don't have the law. Right. But because that's the that's the reform perspective category of all that I'm saying. Yeah. Broken, but not everybody has it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Keith. Uh, Phil. Right, right. That's kind of obviously the transportation. Mm-hmm. The whole realm of experience. So yeah. I think that's an important part of what we're talking about. Really understanding. Yeah, yeah, because it's much more than the, the salvation aspect. I mean, yeah, he's mentioning until heaven and earth pass away. You know, all of that language is more than just salvation. And in, even when you look at the points that are made about the kingdom of heaven and what is done now and not in the eternal state, that's more than just salvation. And so we need to think through that and not just kind of pull a piece of it out and, and read into it what's really not there. It's there, but there's much, much more to it being talked about specifically. So, yeah, Dennis. Yeah, um, you could play Rob. Um, no, it's play, play Rajo. Oh, play, play Rajo. So, but, but part of the discussion is uh, Bonson in his book argues for a unique um, translation understanding of that word and the term. And, uh, and it's something I'm, I'm still working through and trying to like, really understand. And it is, it is kind of a fairly debated. Uh, a translation of that. Um, I don't, there's not a whole lot of support for that, and I think uh, Vern Poitras does a, a review of that, but, uh, so, I mean, it's still something I'm working through, but I, that's part of the discussion of, of where people that would push back against the autumn is really just that term. How do we understand that term? What does it mean to be fulfilled? But, yeah. but I, I don't think even if you don't take that term as confirmed the way Bonson does, I don't think that still uh, that still contradicts the aspect of the yeah. line aspect because you still have to wrestle with what does it mean for Christ to fulfill, right? And what aspects of the law does does he fulfill? Yeah, yeah. But that that's more of the debate there that usually reform guys bring in, kind of using that passage in opposition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it is play Rao. I think that the word fulfilled there, 17, the last time we talked about being, you know, prophecy being fulfilled, that like something was predicted, and now Jesus comes, shows up, and is fulfilled. I think both from this passage and in this sermon here, he 
goes on to go like now down make full like really show go deeper and strengthen. Mm-hmm. I really could use my term I just used <laughs> heal man the law. Like he really like strengthens the law. Yeah. To show that like hey you thought you thought it was just this. Like let me show you about anger, lust, force, lying. Right. Hatred. Right. Yeah. He's making he's making the law very uh, powerful, showing it to be deep. Mm-hmm. So he's not diminishing the law in any way. It's a point why he was drawn. Right. Yep. Yeah, and I think it has. That's why I mentioned Titus two eleven through fourteen is the, the purpose of the of salvation is to then grow us in the obedience of our faith, which is rooted from the righteousness of Christ, and then him fulfilling righteousness within us uh, as we grow. Um, And so there's aspects of that that I think are clear in this that, you know, connect to other scriptures that that don't seem to to make sense of uh, just these objections to really um, diminishing the validity of God's law. I think it it strengthens it. Any other questions or comments, thoughts? Yeah, Dennis. What do you think? Um, I know a common objection, obviously, will be the confession, and specifically when you read Westminster Reform, it specifically says that God gave sundry laws, so civil laws, that were for that state and expired with that. Um, really haven't given that specific thing too much thought. Um, as I've been thinking more about uh, just how, whether we have uh, ways in which we um, create our own law. Um, so uh, I would have to think more about that, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think uh, this, the London Baptist uh, refers to that a little bit differently as it goes on, and it refers to judicial law, the judicial laws. Um, so that's made me even kind of think even more, how, does the, how would that look like, and is it more of a legislative thing or more of a judicial thing? Um, so I, there's a lot to kind of think through, I think, yeah. Joel, you had something? Yeah. Yeah, it's no longer valid. Yeah. Right. It's true and it still stands, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah, Roy. Yeah, I would say it would be civil. I think it would apply, uh, but the punishment should fit the crime. Mm, go ahead. Yeah, but the comment on that, like, that's an example of, we can see the principle carried into, like, our constitution. That the punishment should fit the crime, that there shouldn't be any cruel and unusual punishment. But I would argue that there are, Right, now, right, yeah. There are cruel and unusual punishments happening. That don't fit. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what is the problem there? Is it, why, why did this happen? Right. Well, that's because that we didn't actually import God's law word for word. Yeah. <laughs> we said we, we'll take a principle and then we'll put it out to, we'll put it down in this document, which has an authorial intent. Yeah. And now, you know, 250 years later, we have a society that wants, doesn't even know how to define words. Right. And so they're going, I mean, what should we put it to a vote? Democracy. So now we're relying on a democratic yeah. agreement as to what is cruel, unusual, whatever. God yeah. wants us clear. Yeah. Don't, you, may, you may punish someone. If someone puts out an eye, you may take up to their eye. Yeah. Nothing more. Right. If it's, they, you know, if it's a tooth, up to a tooth. Now, though, that all sounds very barbaric. Yeah. Yeah. We say that, that that sounds cruel and unusual, but it's actually that's what God's law says. It's like it, it wasn't a requirement, it was a maximum. Mm -hmm. That's what the principle is, the maximum punishment. But it spells it out, the principle is much more clear in God's law than our written. Yeah. Yeah, and that's I think for me that's made me think more in situations like that, made me think more of um whether we even uh, this is something that a lot of people don't even, I think, maybe don't even think about um, or just, like, are shocked. Things that, I, something that I would say like this, but the question of whether we would even have a legislative branch to create law. Because then you get into, down the road, situations like that. Or should it be just the judicial in judging according to God's law and God's law being the law? There's a lot of issues with that. There's a lot of things to think through with that, but it's made me think a lot more, and, and I'll, I'll bring this up in one of the classes, but it's a hard thing to think through. But we've seen that play out where we had good principles to start with, but then where have we gone since then? I think that's man creating law, misunderstanding, mis uh, misapplying, misinterpreting law, and that type of stuff that I think is very problematic. It will be if we're given that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So those types, those ceremonial types, pointed to something much greater that was perfect. But the law, but the moral law, the Ten Commandments were perfect from the start. They, they, they were never improved. 
Right. So that's why, like, they just come right through, and we still have ceremonial aspects in our in our faith. Mm-hmm. I mean, we still observe baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, so I mean, Christ. I mean, Paul says Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been slain. So we we still partake in that ceremony. Um, but but it's it has been. But, yeah. but I just feel like understanding like what is abiding when it comes to the law of God. Um, it's so clear that the law, the Ten Commandments, were never were never improved upon. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. And, and I think that the, the, the civil act, the civil applications of them, the official applications of them, the Old Testament, are really just applications of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, they're based upon that. Yep. Yeah, and they were to use those case laws to judge cases. Yeah, and they were they were to use those. Uh, yeah, yeah, and kings were were supposed to write down God's law, to copy it, to know it, so that they would judge according to that, not develop their own. So there's a lot of things to kind of think through. That yeah, any other thoughts or comments or anything? Yeah, Joel. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, as I've kind of thought through this, I, I think it's I think it's just clear. And the hard part is then figuring out a lot of the details, <laughs> which there's there's it calls for a lot of wisdom that I don't have in in a lot of ways, studying and learning and, and growing. But uh, I, I think it's quite clear uh, in in multiple aspects, and one major one is the obligation of civil rulers having to judge according to God's law, according to what justice is, according to God. And to, to really deny that or minimize that from the Christian community, I just, there's a lot of problems with that and a lot of detriment on the church and just on our society in general to come to that conclusion. And I just, I struggle uh, with that. Um, so, yeah. Well, I want to just add one thing. Theonomy is a gospel issue because John says in 1 John, all sin is lawless. Yeah. And if we don't, if we don't have the law of God telling us what sin is, then there's no, there's no, there's going to be no awareness of sin. There's going to be no awareness of a Savior. Yeah. If I'm not a sinner, hey, I don't need a Savior. So yeah. apparently there's a gospel implication to the relevance, the abiding relevance of God's law. If people don't understand the law, then if, if we're making up some other law, then that's not going to draw attention to their deep yeah. sin, their sin against their creator. Yeah. It's not going to draw attention. All these codes and regulations that we live under now, they don't draw attention to sin. They draw attention to code breaking and regulations. And there's 10,000 of them. Um, and it, as long as people pay their taxes and, and do all these things that the state says, the state, you know, sees are God, then I'm a good person. And that's why I think there's so many more of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but if, you bring in the, if you bring in the real law. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we don't, we don't think about the, the law in accordance with the gospel like uh, 1 Timothy 1 talks about. And we don't understand the uses of the law. And I think that, again, that's one area in looking and studying this that just made it so clear to me that this is true. This is important. 
because it's an understanding of how God uses his law within society in those areas of life. Because then now, as you go through the two uses of the law before salvation, and then God uh, saves through the gospel, then what that, what's that new life going to look like? The obedience of faith, growing in zealousness for good works, lawfulness. And so that's going to, again, uh, continue to grow and permeate life itself and get into our jobs, get into our structure of our society and things like that. So I, I, I just don't know how we can minimize the utter importance of a topic like this, especially with what we've dealt with. And through a lot of this, these past three, four years, a lot of Christians have, have been confronted with these questions. Uh, and, and have had to answer them in, in, in many different ways. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. Dennis, you're going to say something else? Yeah, I think from a, especially from a theological perspective, it's, it really comes down to consistency. Because as, I, as I've grown in my understanding of covenant theology, reform theology, as I'm, I'm growing and trying to understand theonomy, I, I think to some degree it's like theonomy is just consistent covenant theology. Because if you obviously no, no, no reformed pastor, no reformed theologian is going to sit there and say, you know, well, we don't need the law, the law is irrelevant, do whatever you want. Yeah. Like, obviously nobody's going to sit there and say that. But the question is, why? Why are you not going to say that? What's going to be your standard? Right. What, what are you standing on? And, and it's kind of, there's an old classic debate uh, between, uh, I forget the two guys, I think it was like the 70s or whatever, but I think it was Gary North and, and it was two, two, two theonomists, and, and, it, and it came down to one, one of the comments they said was like, Christianity is, has been so focused on bringing people into the faith, and then when they come into the faith, and then they try to live that faith out, We've been good at telling them in their personal life how they are to live it. But then if a if a civil ruler comes and asks you, hey, I got saved, what do I do now? Right. It's almost like there's no answer, yep. generally speaking. Yep. It, you know, so even during COVID, what, what was the answers that were provided? Well, just be just be wise. Use wisdom. Yep. But according to what standard, what's wisdom like? Because obviously, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, Josh Shapiro and Biden think they're using wisdom, right? You know, every day that they're doing these tyrannical laws. Yep. Um, and, and I and I think a lot of it, especially from just a theological perspective, just comes down to being consistent with with our theology, and then with how we apply that theology. Yeah, and I think recently I've heard a lot of well-known theologians that I deeply respect have a big disconnect with that, a big inconsistency with that, to then when you go to that area that you're talking about, oh, now I'm a, now I'm a judge, now what do I do? And they have a, a really bad, inconsistent answer to that. Um, so it's, yeah. Yeah. So, yep. so that if we're following the law of God, then by definition it's not it's not tyrannical. You know, hard, you know, heavy handed, top down, you know, jack booted, okay, yes, I not many we don't want any of that. We right. don't want this crushing dictatorial kind of thing. Yeah. But um but if we're following God's law, it's it's just we haven't been following it so much that like it it seems strange to Christians. Right. Right, yeah. And, and, 
Yeah. And what do you do if you're a cop? You, you know, you just don't write a ticket that you don't think should be, you know, or whatever it is. Like most powerful world word in the, in the world is no. Like just, and that we we started to get a hint of that when it came to wear the mask, you know, take the the shot, whatever it is. But the, the most powerful thing we can say is no, and we just need to start. You know, it's not just no, but but that's a good that's a good start. So. Wherever you have legitimate authority, you have a you have a business, you have uh, you know, you're a pastor. Like pastor you need to exercise spiritual discipline if it's necessary. Yeah. Not be scared to do it, but most pastors are scared to do it. Right. They won't touch it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's that's a good question. When's the last time you had somebody in spiritual discipline? Yeah. 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 And ultimately, and you guys have mentioned this, by what standard? It's going to be according to some standard. By what standard? And every law imposes upon someone. So even a lot of Christians, you know, balk at the idea of, oh, you know, you're just going to impose. Yeah, not in that, that ecclesiocracy sense, in that uh, dictatorial sense, but law imposes upon people. <laughs> and so we need to understand and grasp just what that means from a biblical perspective from the law of God and, and wanting the best for sinners. And the best for sinners is understanding both of those, law and gospel, and how they're used within a society. Joel, were you going to say something else? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think even on mentioning that, you know, even if, you know, as we mentioned, even the Constitution, maybe in a questionable light or examining it, Christians automatically are like, oh, no, don't do that, or how dare you, or just look negatively on all of what we're talking about tonight and this, this month. But I think we need to just slow down and just listen and think through it, examine the various documents and, and, and um, just be slow to, to jump in these objections and these assumptions. Um, because again, the more I think about even just that concept, the more I, I think about how, you know, legislative, judicial, all that type of stuff and, and how that plays out in a society and what can happen. Uh, so it, it's, it's an important topic and I, I would encourage people to just go and listen to just go and, and, and listen to that debate, uh, listen openly, um, where you gr agree or don't agree, whatever, just go and learn. Um, be informed by the two positions, because a debate, you actually are listening to the people who hold the positions, and they're debating against each other. So listen to both of them, examine them, test them. Um, but yeah, I think that's an important one. That's in, is that at Woodcrest? Okay, Woodcrest down in Ephrata, right? Yeah, Woodcrest Retreat Center, um, May 17th, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock? 6 o'clock, okay. Yeah, so any other comments or anything? Yeah. Yeah, Honor the Sun. I haven't watched it yet. Um, it's by Nathan Anderson, uh, who did uh, as On Earth As It Is in Heaven. Um, he put a new documentary out, uh, Honor the Sun, and it talks a lot about this stuff. I'm looking forward to watching it, so I'd encourage. Is it free on YouTube? Okay, that's what I thought. So, yeah, so I watched that. Um, good, good, good documentary. Anything else? 
Yes. Do <laughs> um, you want to promote that? Go ahead. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good good event that we're going to start doing. So, cool. Anything else? Y'all ready to go eat? Most of you. Okay. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you. We thank you for these times that we can come together as your body, uh, collective, and to study various topics, important ones. Um, so help us to move slowly with these. Help us to um, to think through them with a consistency in Scripture uh, and to, um, to listen to the positions that are held by people, and there's even varying degrees within that, but uh, to be listeners, to be examining in light of your Word and uh, all of this. And this is, again, and I think a very important topic that Christians ought to to deal with, ought to think through, um, and to go to the sources uh, for what is believed, and then go to the word, your word, to examine in light of it. So, as we get into this subject, uh, again, just four weeks is not a lot of time to dig into a lot of the details, and I, there is a lot of questions, a lot of details. So, help us to help me to prepare faithfully uh, to to deal with them and for us to discuss them as your body. Um, but we thank you for these times that we're able to do this, uh, to be growing and to be being equipped by uh, your word uh, for, for ministry, for all of life, what we're called to do. So as we go down to eat a meal together, uh, we pray that you bless the food and the discussions, the conversation. May it all be glorifying to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.